Okay. Okay. So uh, I had made a promise last week that this week we're going to do uh, three subjects. We're going to try to do one mitzvah in our mitzvah series, one mishnah in our mishnah series, and the next edition of the uh, 13 principles, which was principle number eight. Um, unfortunately, this past week I've been uh, quite ill, actually. I, was, I wasn't feeling well. And uh, I was so sure I had coronavirus um, at one juncture, like on Tuesday. Um, I'm feeling much better. So I, I don't think, uh, I think I dodged that bullet, at least for now. You know, it's, uh, everyone's playing this game, you know, how, how, much, how much longer can we outlast the virus? Uh, but as a result, I really didn't have time to, uh, to, fully, uh, to fully prepare the 13 principles class that I wanted to prepare. And I don't want to give y'all half-baked goods. So therefore, I'm, we're going uh, to kick that down to next week. And please, God, we'll have it, uh, we'll have it next week. So today we're going to do a, uh, a mitzvah and a mishnah. Now, before we begin, I'd like to share something um, quite personal, I think, um, and not so flattering, but I think there's such a valuable lesson, and it hit me so hard this week that I thought I would share it with my best friends. There was a gentleman... I didn't know much about him. Um, he was a, kind of like a cowboy convert. He was like a real rugged Texan, I think. Uh, and he used to always wear his cowboy hats, but he lived in Israel. I mean, he converted and lived, lived in Israel. But then he showed up in, in Houston, in our community, for a few months. And then every couple of years, he would come back for a few months. So we kind of got to know him. But anyhow, I had uh, an interaction with him that was, um, I would say, um, uh, a bit unpleasant, um, and that's from my end, and uh, regrettable. What happened was that there was someone in the neighborhood that had a, a, a wicked recipe for, for making the chullen stew, and he gave it to me, and then this guy shows up, this uh, cowboy convert that shows up, and he wants to get the recipe for me. So he, give, he starts calling me all the time. And I, I didn't have time. I was, I was like busy with a lot of stuff at that time. Anyhow, he shows up to my house like at the busiest time of the week. It was like a reenactment of what happened with Hillel in the Talmud. The Talmud talks about Hillel. That Hillel, it was Friday afternoon, which is the busiest time of the week because you got to prepare because you got to prepare for Shabbos. And there was someone that says that I can agitate Hillel. So at the busiest time of the week, he shows up to Hillel's house and starts asking him these uh, asinine questions like, you know, why do Indians have wide feet? You know, and, and he does it multiple times because he has a bet with another guy. I can make, I can make Hillel uh, angry or I can agitate Hillel. Anyhow, I totally failed the Hillel test. And it was like, it was like Friday afternoon. It was one of those really hectic times. And someone's coming to me and asking me about a recipe. And I'm like with my kids. And I don't remember what the story was exactly. So I, I said to him, I said, I can't, I, can't, I can't deal with you right now. I don't remember the details, but I felt really bad afterwards. You know, I felt like, you know, it's not nice to speak to someone like that. And, you know, and I recognize that this is me wrong. And um, I found him. And I got his number because he had already left, I think. And I called him up and I apologized. And I, I asked him, please forgive me. You know, I made a mistake. I, I didn't treat you correctly. I, I was a little bit uh, flustered, but still it's no excuse to, uh, to treat someone like that. And he was gracious enough and he, and he forgave me. <clears throat> Anyhow, why am I telling you all this story? This week, this gentleman passed away. Now, he was actually in Houston for Pesach. And I saw him over Pesach. And he looked totally fine. Um, obviously it was an unusual Pesach, uh, but I happened to have been walking around the neighborhood and I saw him and I was say, hey, hey, how you doing? And he looked hundred percent fine. And then I got an email this week. Uh, we are saddened to inform you of the sudden passing of, uh, of, of Matisyahu ben Avraham. Matisyahu, the son of Avraham, because he's a convert. All converts are the sons of Abraham and, and Sarah. And I was thinking, 
how would I be feeling right now if I had not secured that forgiveness? And, and that's what I wanted to share with you. I think it's, it's a really valuable thing. You know, we're told in the Talmud, we're told that when someone sins against God, you got to petition God for forgiveness. Of course, we have a whole, a whole season for that. We have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and all the prayers and all the fasting and all that. And it's all institutionalized how the Almighty can be approached and can be lobbied to give forgiveness. But with sins against other people, it doesn't work like that. There isn't like a scheduled time and there isn't a scheduled uh, format and there isn't a formula that you follow. You have to just make sure that that person forgives you. And if the person doesn't forgive you, well, then there's some sort of blemish. There's a, there's a blight on your soul that only that person can fix. And the Talmud actually does talk about, the Ram talks about what happens if that person already passes. How do you secure forgiveness from the deceased? And there is a process to do that. You got to take a whole minion and you got to go to the, you got to go to the grave site and you have to petition and there's a whole format to do it, but it's not simple at all. And it made me think, you know, this is a time where people, people are dying. Yes, of course, 99.9% .9 of people are fine. And most of the people that we know are okay. But I think it's a good lesson, especially because it hit me so hard to make sure that we're square, that we're good with everyone and not to kick stuff, not to hit the can down the road. If for someone that you mistreated or you didn't treat properly or someone that you offended or someone that you caused pain, whatever it is, like you'd want to make sure that you get that uncomfortable conversation. It's an uncomfortable conversation, of course, but get that done pronto because you never know how many opportunities you'll have. And no one wants to live with the weight, with the gravity uh, with that uh, terrible feeling of knowing someone has something against them, and now they can never, their soul can never be complete until they are granted that uh, that forgiveness. So I, I know it's not related to what we wanted to talk about today, but I thought it was something that uh, really hit me this week, and therefore I figured I would share it, even though I don't come out, uh, you know, in the best of light. But I, I, you know, everyone makes mistakes, and. I'm happy that uh, I was able to secure forgiveness um, and uh, I'm going to dedicate uh, today's talk in loving memory, Lilo Nishmas Matasya Ben Avram, may his soul be elevated in heaven. And uh, may we all take this lesson from him to make sure that, uh, that if there is someone, and invariably, you know, we're not angels. If we were angels, we wouldn't need Torah. Angels don't have the Torah. We have the Torah. So we're not angels, and we all make mistakes, and that's okay. But make sure that we secure forgiveness before we don't have the opportunity to do that anymore, before time expires. Okay, and by the way, there's a mission upcoming in Perkyavos, and we'll get to it, please God, that talks about repenting the day before you die. So when's that? Could be today. Could be yesterday. Could be tomorrow. Could be every day. And therefore, why take chances with that? Okay, we're going to start with a mitzvah. We are up to mitzvah number 57. And today we're going to do 57, 58, 59, 60, and 336. And the reason why we're doing all these five mitzvahs together is because they are interrelated. Now, we've been discussing recently the mitzvahs related to interpersonal monetary conflict. We talked about someone who causes damage to another person or someone's property causes damage to another person's property. And the mitzvahs that we're going to talk about today are the adjudication. The court is mandated to oversee and adjudicate interactions, conflicts between, between plaintiffs and between defendants, and specifically with respect to guardians and custodians. If I give something, if I deposit something by someone else's home and someone else's possession, they have certain responsibilities. And if, under certain circumstances, we shall see if that item gets lost or damaged uh, or somehow it was ruined, that person may be liable. And of course, the court has to know all these laws to be able to adjudicate these, case, these cases properly. 
Now, in Jewish law, there are four types of custodians, meaning if my item is in someone else's home, it could be under four different regimes of law. I can have, let's say, I'll be going on vacation, and I have my pet, and I give my pet to my friend, could you please watch my pet? Or could you please watch my valuable item? And I'm not offering any payment. That person is doing it from the goodness of their heart. They're watching it for free. And as a result, because they're doing me a whole favor, I'm not paying for it. Therefore, they have the least amount of responsibility. That would be example one. I deposit something by someone else. If they're called a shomer chinam, they're watching it for free. And therefore, they have the least amount of liability. And they're only going... And they're only going to be liable in a case of gross negligence. A second kind of custodian or, or guardian is someone who watches for a fee. I, I will pay you to watch my item. And therefore, because you get paid for it, you will have heightened liability. A third example is a renter. I rent my item to you. You pay me for it. And you're entitled to use that item. And therefore, you, you do get some benefit from being the guardian, being the custodian of that item, and therefore that has its own category. And finally, you have the borrower. You, my neighbor, comes to my house and borrows something from me, and of course, he has all the benefit. He's borrowing my item, he's borrowing my rake, he's borrowing my lawnmower, he's borrowing my phone. And consequently, because he has all the benefit, and I have no benefit, in that case, the borrower, the custodian, has the most amount of liability. Now, all these laws are like condensed in the Torah into a few short verses, as they often are. Whereas if you open up the Talmud, you'll find essentially books of Talmud, and you'll find students all over the world, some of the best and brightest Jewish minds, churning over all the various different permutations of the Talmud, and all the commentary. Of course, it is very complex, but our goal is to give a brief snapshot of this mitzvah, what some of the laws are, maybe some of the interesting cases, and, uh, and to get a little bit of a picture, a little bit of a taste of these laws. So the first mitzvah I cover is mitzvah number 58, and that is that the court is responsible to oversee the judicial cases of plaintiffs and defendants. And that could be in a case where there's a dispute over a loan or a deposit or theft i.e. I come to the court and I say someone stole from me, they have to respond to that claim and they have to, of course, engage with the witnesses and the evidence as we shall see, or if there's any other monetary complaint or robbery. That's a verse from the Torah that we have to appoint courts to oversee civil, personal disputes of, of monetary nature. Now, again, I want to give this disclaimer. These laws are vast. These laws are complex. They span whole books of Talmud, but we're going to try to give a, a little bit of a taste of these mitzvahs. So what does a court do when they are presented with a monetary case? So, of course, they look for evidence. And evidence could be in the form of documentation. It could be in the form of contracts. It's, of course, in the form of witness testimony and how they have to process the witnesses to determine if they're legitimate. Were they witnesses for hire? They have to, of course, examine the witnesses. They have to evaluate the precise claims of the plaintiff and the response of the defendant. And, of course, they can use, they can administer oaths as a way of determining whether or not a claim is credible. And the idea behind this is that people are very, very hesitant to swear on all that is holy, and therefore this is a tool that the court has, Torah gives the court, to be able to help verify unverifiable information. You have person A saying the person owes me, person B says it's not true, and of course the court wasn't there, and maybe the witnesses are not reliable, and of course there's a million different cases, but one of the tools, and this is a very important idea in Torah law, they can verify what's invisible to them by employing the oath 
based upon the understanding that people are very reticent to violate their oaths. Now, there are three different instances when someone would be biblically, when someone would be biblically obligated to perform an oath. So here's the first case. Suppose the plaintiff says that the defendant owes them $100. They borrowed the money, let's say. The defendant says, yes, I owe you money, but I don't owe you $100, I owe you $50. This is what's called a hoda bimitsas hataina, meaning a partial admittance, partial admittance of the claim. The claim was 100, and the admittance was, was partial. And therefore, it seems like there's something amiss. The person is admitting that there was some sort of oath, but it wasn't quite that. In that case, there will be a biblically mandated oath the defendant will have to swear on a Torah scroll on all that is holy, they would have to swear that they only owe 50. And if they indeed are unwilling to do it, they would have to pay the full 100. That's the first example. Second example is, like we mentioned, you need witnesses. But in, Jewish, in a Jewish court, you always need two witnesses, a minimum of two witnesses. So suppose I come to court, I bring someone with me, I say, this person owes me $100, and I have, I have evidence, I have a witness, but I have only one witness. So the law is that in the event of someone having insufficient witnesses, that's not enough to mandate a ruling or to, to, to force a ruling, but that can force an oath. I say some, someone owes me $100, I have one witness that says, yeah, I was there. They borrowed the money. It was, it was, all, it was all legit. I was there. I witnessed it. And, but there's only one witness. Maybe the second witness died. Maybe there only was one person there who was privy to that exchange. That person cannot obligate a ruling, but can obligate a biblical oath. And finally, if there is a custodian, if there is a custodian, in a case, on certain cases, we shall see if there's a custodian, the custodian would be obligated to make an oath. Now, I want to point out that there are also rabbinically instituted oaths, even in a, an event where someone has a total denial. I say, you owe me $100. The person says, I owe you zilch, nada, nothing, nil, zero. I don't owe you anything. From a biblical perspective, we would say, the person is not obligated to swear. However, there is a rabbinically instituted oath because people don't just make these random claims for nothing. Well, that's the assumption, at least. And therefore, the rabbis will institute a, a lower level of an oath just to make sure, just to make sure that the person is not just disregarding the true claim. Now, there are a whole host of differences between a biblically mandated oath and a rabbinically mandated oath. So what happens, for example, if the person is obligated to make a biblical oath and the defendant refuses to swear? I'm not going to do it. I don't owe them the money, but I'm not going to do it. I owe them only 50, not the 100, but I don't want to swear. Well, in that case, we would garnish their money. We would take away their assets because they have to swear if they're not swearing. Well, then they're liable. If someone refuses to do a rabbinic oath, they're going to be labeled a sinner and they could be punished at the court's discretion, but the ruling is not brought into effect. Into, into effect. Here's another interesting question that Talmud talks about. What if you have a case where the defendant says, I don't want to swear. I'm not comfortable swearing. But why don't you take the opposite oath. Let me throw the ball back into your court. You say, I owe you money. I say, it's not true. I don't want to swear. You swear that it is true, and I'll pay you the money. Can the defendant take the oath and put it back in the plaintiff's court? Um, no pun intended. And the answer is, it depends. If it is a biblical oath, then the answer is no. If it's a rabbinic oath, then it's complicated, but under certain conditions, that could happen where the oath is mandated on one person, but they could throw it in the other person's court. What happens if we suspect that the defendant will perjure himself? If we have some reason to believe that the person may be lying, 
then we, from a biblical perspective, the plaintiff would swear and take the money, and rabbinically we won't institute an oath when there is grounds for such a suspicion. And of course, these are different types of oaths. You would have a biblical oath. You would hold a sacred item, a Torah scroll, maybe tefillin or something like that, and you would say, I'm, dis- I'm swearing on the name of God that I am telling the truth. So these are some of the laws related to oath. I want to point out that this is a very big and fascinating subject in the Talmud. Of course, we're only getting a small sprinkling of it. Uh, when I was in yeshiva, I had the great fortune of actually authoring several essays on the subject of an oath of partial admittance. And of course, this sounds really riveting to us. Oh, wow, where do I sign? How do I get a copy of that abstract? But it actually is, once you get into the real meat, you know, the real meat of the subject, it's, it's kind of very fascinating. And there's a lot of, of wonderful commentary and, and sources and, and uh, uh, the fascinating Rambams, of course. Um, the idea that I swear, I am required to swear in the event that I have a partial admittance of a claim. So that's some of the laws related to the first mitzvah. Mitzvah number four, uh, four, uh, 58, that require us to create court ca- courts or court, court system, a judiciary, to judge matters of civil dispute. Mitzvah number 57 is the law of an unpaid custodian. Again, this is someone that I give something to. I say, here, take my, my item, my, valu- my valuable thing, and watch it for me. What if I come back a month later and I say, okay, where's my watch? Where's my phone? Where is my valuable? And the person says, well, it was stolen. Well, I lost it. In that case, the person would be required to swear that it was indeed lost or stolen, and then they would be absolved of any responsibility. Now, there's an interesting idea here. Talmud says that once someone is swearing about one thing, there's already an oath in place, we roll other stuff into it. Namely, we require him to add to his oath the following clause. I didn't touch it, and I watched it properly. What if there was gross negligence? The person, he left the barn door open. Where is my horse? Oh, I don't know. You didn't pay me to watch it. I left my barn door open, and it just marched out. It could be anywhere by now. Well, in that case, even though they weren't paid to be a custodian, they are liable to to pay. And if the person, for example, uses it without permission, so I I say, okay, here, watch this. Don't touch it. Just watch it. And they say, eh, it's in my house. I'm using it. Automatically, they are becoming liable for anything, even if it was a total accident. So that's a... Uh, an unpaid custodian. What about if someone is a paid custodian or a renter? So then even if it was stolen, even if it was lost, they are required to pay. So because they gain some benefit from it, then they are required to elevate the, the, the guardianship, so to speak, and they would be required to pay in the event that it was lost or stolen. If it was a total accident, you know, you'd give me, I rent your animal. And the animal just dies. It has a heart attack. It's not my fault. It was a total accident. <clears throat> In that case, the renter or the custodian is off the hook, provided that they swear. Uh, finally, we have the third type of custodian. It's really the fourth, because renter and someone who is a paid custodian have the same laws. The fourth kind of custodian is a borrower. I come to my neighbor. Will you lend me your haircut machine? This is a time a lot of people are doing at-home haircuts. Can I borrow your haircut machine? I actually already lent out my clippers to my to multiple neighbors multiple times. So in that case, because all the benefit is accrued to the borrower, and by the way, in, in English, the borrower, like if you borrow money from the bank, you're actually paying them back. But if I borrow the rake from my neighbor, it's the same word. So it's a little bit imprecise. But in this context, it means you borrow it and you're not paying a fee. 
You're not paying back with interest. You're just borrowing it and you give it right back. In that case, if the item is not given back in pristine condition, then it is the responsibility of the person who is the, the custodian who is the borrower. And the logic behind that is if I lend you money for an investment and your investment goes south, no one's going to argue that you shouldn't pay me back. I had no business with your investment. I lent you money. Give me back the money. I gave you a rake. Give me back a rake. There's no, I, I'm assuming no responsibility. I'm assuming no liability. When I give it to you, you have 100% liability. There's only two cases where the borrower is not liable for damage done to the item. Either if it dies amidst doing what it was supposed to do. So the example the Talmud gives is if the animal, I borrowed your animal to plow my field, and I'm in the middle of plowing my field, and amidst doing precisely what I borrowed it you know, for, amidst that, it dies. In that case, I am not liable. And there's, a, there's a various reasons as to why that would be the case. Uh, one of the commentaries, for example, says that it was clearly ill-suited for the job that it was borrowed for, and therefore it's not my fault. I told you I want to borrow it for plowing. I used it for plowing. It died. It couldn't handle that kind of work. It's not my fault. You shouldn't have get, given it to me under those conditions. Alternatively, because the owner knew that this was its intended use, and he allowed it, that equals him assuming responsibility for such losses. A second case where the borrower would not be liable would be, is, would be in the event that the owner is with him at the time of borrowing. And the logic behind that is that the owner should have watched it himself if he was present. Now, I think a really relevant question is the following dilemma. Is there anything that we could borrow from our friend without explicit permission? Can I, I, no one would say I could just take my friend's car and borrow it. I'm not going to damage it. You have to ask permission to use your friend's car. Is there anything that I can borrow without asking explicit permission? So there's an interesting law. And the law states that religious articles such as tefillin or a talis or Torah books, there is an assumption, and this is an assumption that comes from the Talmud, that people would be very desirous that other people use their articles for a mitzvah. People want mitzvahs to be done with their items. And therefore, there's a, there's a blanket assumption that people would be okay with, with others borrowing their religious articles provided they return it promptly and in pristine condition, and they don't remove it, they don't change, they don't, they don't move it location. For example, in the yeshiva, this was always the question, you know, if I see, I open a book, I see a book, I really want to look at this book, this Torah book, because it's relevant to what I'm studying, or because I don't have a copy of this particular book. In that event, I'm allowed to use it, provided I use it quickly, and I maintain total control over it, I put it back, in pristine condition. Now, when I was 17, I was in yeshiva in Israel, and I had a copy of a certain book. This was actually a book authored by my grandfather. Not only that, he had given me a copy, and he had written a nice dedication to it to me on the first page. So it wasn't just any book; it was like a book that I really was really important to me. And then, for like a month, I couldn't find it. Why? Someone borrowed it, and they didn't put it back. And when I finally got it back, I said, you know what? This is not happening again. So I opened up the, the copy, the book, and I wrote inside, it is prohibited to use it. I wrote it in Hebrew. It is prohibited to use it. And even if you ask me permission, and I say yes, it's still prohibited to use it. You have to get explicit permission, not, not generic permission. You have to get explicit permission. And by the way, this book is still on my bookshelf in my, in my home office. 
and it still has the little rant that I wrote when I was 17. And again, this is interesting. Despite the fact that normally you need explicit permission in the event of a, of a mitzvah, like a, a Torah article or the like, there is an assumed permission unless there is an explicit prohibition. In that case, you would not be allowed uh, to use in general. Lending books, I find, is, is often a one-way trip. Uh, you lend the book out and you'll never see it again. I heard someone uh, on a podcast say that his policy is whenever someone asked, it used to be, says it used to be, whenever someone asked to borrow a book, he would say no because he never gets it back. But his new policy is whenever someone asks to borrow a book, he says yes, gives that person the book, and then just buys a replica, a replacement copy because he knows he's never going to get it back. Um, it is interesting. Rabbi, you have a question in the uh, chat section. Uh, hey, hey, hi, Rabbi. Hey, I'm, I'm wondering... I'm wondering if, um, I know like, for example, if the horse dies in the field, <coughs> I'm not liable for it, but shouldn't I pay him back out of some, you know, not you goodness could. of my heart, but right now? Listen, it's, uh, it's a nice thing to do, but you're not liable. You're not obligated to do it. So that would be the answer. It's, it's something you could do. It's nice. It's generous. It's kind, but it's not obligatory. And, and when we're dealing with a court, we want to know what are your rights, what are your responsibilities, what are your requirements, what are you actually liable, liable for? Of course, if someone, if someone wants to do it, they won't even come to court. I would say, you know what, I'm not, even, I'm not liable, but I'm going to give it to you anyhow because I don't want you to have harsh feelings and because after all, you did lose. So there's a lot of arguments that you could present to, uh, to do that, but um, you wouldn't be required to do it. Another example of this is, by the way, that the Talmud says, this is a great formulation of the Talmud. Talmud says, meeting children is bad. And of course, it's in the context of what I'm going to elucidate. Why? Because if someone injures or damages a child, they're, they're, they're liable. So this child has an item. Child has a, they own something. And you break it. Accidentally, whatever, you are required to pay. Whereas if a child damages your stuff, technically they're not obligated. And by the way, you can't come to their guardians, to their parents and say they have to pay. They're not paying. Halakhically speaking, if a child damages your item, you're out of luck. So the Talmud says meeting them is bad because if, they, if you damage them, you're liable, they damage you, you are not liable. So what happens if my kid smashes my neighbor, my neighbor's window with a baseball? Which may or may not have happened. What I would do, like you suggested, Bruce, I, I would pay them. Why? Because this was my kid. I'd scream at my kid, of course. But I, I, but I, would, but I, would, I would pay them because that is, you know, and that's, you want to have a, it's, 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 it's a neighbor, you know, you, maybe it was a neighbor, you wouldn't pay him, you know. You don't want to have harsh feelings, but you're not technically uh, obligated to yeah. do that. I like, I like the answer because in some ways it says that friendship supersedes the law. Well, it, it, it's, it's a different subject. The subject uh, that the Talmud and the court was responsible to do is to tell what the law is. As to whether or not someone could go above and beyond the call of law, the call of duty, and say, I want to do it. I want to be generous and give it. And, you know, I want to be benevolent and give it. Of course. But that, that's not the actual subject the court is responsible to, to, to deal with. That's not, that's not, that's not, their, that's not uh, their jurisdiction. Yeah, it, 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 it borderlines <laughs> on thinking about how that affects the Good Samaritan laws. Good Samaritan laws, meaning that if I'm trying to do something good, I can't be responsible for any uh, residual damage. Is that right? Yeah. Or am I responsible for doing anything to start with? Yes. Uh, all great. Yes. Great. Great subjects. But I do. I do bristle at the term Good Samaritan. Uh, you, you, I'm yeah, sure I knew. I knew that would come up. Right but it's just part of my culture. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's what's called in America. In America, it's 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 it's, it's actual legal term, if I'm not mistaken, Good Samaritan law. But uh, I guess it wouldn't be 
as uh, it wouldn't roll off the tongue if you said the bad Samaritan law, right? You wouldn't say that. But anyhow, historically, we've had a lot of challenges with the Samaritans. But yes, uh, as to the Good Samaritan law, uh, you would be obligated. There's a mitzvah of the Torah. We haven't gotten to it yet. There's a mitzvah of the Torah. Do not stand idly when your brother's blood is being shed. You're not allowed to say, oh, it's not my problem. That person's dying, but, you know, I'm not looking. I'm looking the other way. So there is a requirement for you to for you to try to save people that are in 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 danger. Now you are there are certain carve outs, the equivalent of Good Samaritan laws. Like for example, Tama talks about what if there was a, a physician who botched the surgery uh, or, or made a mistake and killed the patient. It's not murder. The intention was noble, and they, they can't be judged because they were doing something good. And they, you know, they, they, you know, things don't work out the way they wanted it. So there would there would be uh, carve outs uh, for that. Uh, and Talmud talks about, for example, suppose there is a rodif. What's a rodif? A rodif is a pursuer. Someone is pursuing someone else. Why are they pursuing them? Because they want to give them a job. They want to give them a promotion. No, because they want to kill them. So everyone's re- required to try to save the victim. Even if it means shooting the pursuer, we're allowed, to, well, we're allowed to, we're required to do it. Of course, we have to aim for the knees or aim for the legs. But if, if not, if there's no other option, we have to actually kill the person to prevent them from doing this heinous crime of murdering someone or even raping someone. That's the law. So what if I employ someone's items and I damage someone's items to try to save the victim who has to pay for that so person A is chasing person B person C takes person D's uh, glass item and throws it at the perpetrator and smashes it on his head and stops the uh, pursuit who has to pay for the damaged items, is it the person who was being pursued or is it the person that did the mitzvah of, of saving the victim? You know, some mitzvahs are expensive. We just went through Pesach. It's an expensive holiday. You have these crackers, massive crackers. Very expensive. I paid $31 a pound for my matzah. That's a lot. It's like uh, 50 cents a bite. So what's the answer to that question, Rabbi? Who pays uh, in that A, B, C, D scenario you just I, I am pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it depends whose item it was. Depends whose item it was. I think if it's person A or B, then um, person C is not liable. I don't remember the details. It's, I tell you what you're going to find in the Talmud. You can find it in the book of St. Andrew, page 74. Um, that's where it talks about it. I remember the details. I remember one of the arguments was, well, if you could shoot the guy, you could definitely damage his money to stop this, this, uh, this thing. So definitely, if it's a pursuer's money, you could stop it. Yeah, but, it's, person, uh, obviously, it's person B's brother because person B is dead. Or is... Well, he didn't say he necessarily died. Right. So uh, what I was, and the reason, and that segues, Bruce and Rabbi, into what I was thinking now. You said, I may have forgotten some of the scenarios. You said A is chasing B, uh, and tell, just go, go through it again. Uh, yeah, you have four people involved. Right. You have, you have uh, person A who is, um, who is pursuing person B. Right. The whole world is required to save that person. Even if, it means B. B. Save B. even if it means damaging or even killing person A. Okay. And uh, one of the ploys that person C, who's trying to save person B, uses is takes the items of another person or person, person A B. or person B and, uh, and uses them to, to save a second person. Well, I, don't, I, don't I thought you said he took it. Point. I thought you said he took it from person D. Or person D, that's right. That's right. Okay. That's right. 
Because I thought, now I don't know what the law is or what the Talmud says, but but I think A is responsible because um, uh, A is the one in, implied to be the perpetrator, right? Yes. Uh, okay. So isn't it ultimate, whatever you have to do to stop A, assuming A lives, but it's stopped, isn't it ultimately A's responsibility to pay person D for the item that was used to stop person A? That's what you would say. I, I don't want to I don't want to say this because I don't remember the exact uh, back and forth of the Talmud. I don't know. Uh, I, but, I'm just uh, that, 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 seems, that seems very reasonable where you're saying obviously. obviously. Yeah, I'm trying to think of it in a moral standpoint for whatever that's worth. Uh, you know, but I I'd be curious as to what the Talmudic justification is for whatever they would do. Yes, yes. yes. Um, I could get it now. It's actually not far away. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm not. That's okay. You know, I, there was, <coughs> in my past life, I, I think I, or uh, next life, I should be a lawyer. So, you yeah. know. Well, it's never too late. <laughs> I have another question that popped up here. Let's see. Uh, I loaned an old coworker my dental. Okay, never got it back. Uh, then go back to work. Should you forget about it? That was the question. So you, they loaned out the dental assisting textbook, asked for it back, didn't get it back, and now they want it again. And should they ask that person again? Yeah, you would imagine they should. Why not? Person has your book. You want your book? Ask, ask, ask it back for them. Um, I, most people don't maliciously steal other people's books. That's what I found. They just put it on their shelves, and on the shelf, it's not immediately evident that it's someone else's. You know, you have a shelf full of books. So the, I, I think most people they just forget about it, and and they just uh, they just ignore it. But uh, no, you, no statute of limitations of forfeiture. No, there's no statute of limitations. It's, it's your book. It's not someone else. It's not, it's not someone else's book. The fact that it's just in someone else's domain, it doesn't change its status. Um, the, the, the statute of limitations, um, there is one instance where that logic would apply in, in, in civil law. Um, but it's not really a statute of limitations. So, they're, 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 like, what's the logic of that statute of limitations? What's the logic? Like, if it's, you know, why should justice somehow erode over time? The, Right, so so that that actually does not appear in in the in the Talmud. What does appear is in the event that I'm, let's say, squatting on your property, and I claim it's actually my property. You sold it to me. And you say, "No, I never sold it to you." And the court says, "Okay, well, where's the document? Where's the contract?" And I say, contract, I've been living here for years. I misplaced it. I lost it. I don't know where it is. So in the event of such a, of such a uh, conflict, we know it was person A's originally. Uh, a decade ago, he owned it. I've been there for years. And I say, I bought it and I've been living here. That person says, I never sold it. They're squatting. So Talmud says that we assume people don't allow others to squat in their field forever. And therefore, if the person didn't pose a, um, uh, a protest against me squatting, and that existed for three years, for three years, they're, they're, they're squatting in my field, and there's no protest, that is sufficient evidence that it's not really, it's not really squatting, I'm really the owner. So that's the, called the chazaka of three years. It's that's a major subject. Like we spent months and months and months on this subject, and we weren't just twiddling our thumbs. I promise. Okay, so interesting questions. Uh, any other interesting questions before we proceed? Okay, um, there is an interesting case that is discussed in the Talmud. Again, there's there's thousands. We're going to pick a few here and there, and the question is: Suppose there was a renter who decide to kind of sublease and to give it off to someone else. 
this is a subject. You know, if I am a custodian, can I make a custodian for a different person? Person A gives me the item. Can I give it off to person B or C to watch it now for me? The general rule is no. You can't take someone else's item and pass it off to a third party. But suppose someone did that. I rented the item from the owner, and therefore I have the liability of the renter, and I decide to let my neighbor use it. He's the borrower now. And of course, the borrower has the highest degree of liability because they have all the benefits. And now the item dies or the item gets ruined in that person's property. And this creates an interesting dilemma. The renter, me, is not liable for natural death. The borrower is liable for natural death. So can I, the renter, swear to the original owner and say, listen, it died a natural death. I could swear. I'm not liable. And the borrower will actually pay me. That one says, can I profit off the original owner's item because I decided to give someone else who had a higher degree of liability and it was damaged at the degree of liability that only they're responsible and I'm not responsible. And that is an interesting debate that Talmud brings, again, one of many. <clears throat> the final mitzvah that I want to talk about is mitzvah 336, and it's because it's related, and that is the, the question of adjudication of commerce disputes. The, uh, the seller and the buyer, and there could be a myriad of disputes that they may have related to this. Uh, did he sell it? Was it a good sale? Was it um, damaged uh, goods? And therefore, the sale could be perhaps annulled. Now, it's interesting, the Sefer Chinuch, the book that we're using to guide us through the mitzvahs, he asked the question, you know, there's so many mitzvahs that are so similar, why do we have to have so many mitzvahs? The court has to see disputes, and that could include all kinds of disputes. Why do we have to kind of um, spread them out over different mitzvahs? And he says that there's a pattern throughout the Torah. When something is so essential, so critical, the Torah gives us multiple mitzvahs for each angle, for each dimension of that particular thing. And because commerce and interpersonal um, uh, economic activity is so important, it happens every day. Well, at least it used to happen every day. It used to happen every day before the shutdown. But it's something that really is the engine behind civilization. Therefore, it's important to have so many different mitzvahs. So, for example, idolatry. There's 44 different mitzvahs related to this vast subject of idolatry. Why? Because it relates to the bedrock of, of our religion, to the bedrock of, of the Torah. And therefore, because it's so important, it's so critical, all the various angles are fleshed out into their own mitzvah. You know, Shabbos, there's 12 different mitzvahs with Shabbos, and uh, many mitzvahs related to um, loving the convert, for example, mitzvahs that are related uh, to Lashon Hara, there's 31 different mitzvahs related to Lashon Hara, such important stuff, such things, uh, things that come up so frequently, and therefore it is critical for us to have a lot of mitzvahs related to them. So just briefly, how does someone acquire something? How does item A go from being in the ownership of person A to person B? So we're told, interestingly, that if I give money to the store owner and that is done in exchange for the item, from a biblical perspective, the transaction has been consummated. It's done. However, rabbinically, there's all sorts of stringencies added to deal-making. Why? This is interesting. We want to eliminate as much dead space as possible between the deal and the transfer of goods. What's going to be? I have a big item. I don't know. I have a bushel of wheat in my storehouse. I want to sell it to you. You give me the money. It's yours. But where is it physically located? It's physically located in my storehouse. God forbid there's a fire. What, what, what do I do? I save all my stuff. Let your stuff burn. Why? Because it's not mine. And I have no, I have no incentive to, to save it. And therefore, the rabbis were concerned 
that a deal has been consummated, but now there is this asymmetry, and now there is the danger of the item not being sufficiently guarded because it's not technically owned by the person who is harboring it. And therefore, the halacha is that unless the person has actually acquired their item, the deal is not done. So if there's movable property, then you can lift it, you can draw it, you can pull it, you can hand it over like a, a boat, for example. Someone talks about it's too heavy to lift. Uh, and then non-movable property, real property, that is done either by money, by contract, by asserting ownership. Someone talks about putting a fence or other uh, ways of acquiring. Again, this is a vast subject. And we're just trying to give a little taste a small little dabbling of these mitzvahs, and these are the mitzvahs related to courts, courts being established to oversee not criminal uh, questions, not, qu- not criminal cases, but interpersonal and monetary cases. And that will ensure that we'll have a happy and functioning society where people know that their property rights are respected and that justice will be meted out for all. Okay, I saw there was another question here. Let me respond to that before we get to. Okay, great question that I got here from uh, privately. Why is this related mitzvah so much later in the Torah? Okay, so that's a great question. And the answer is that there are certain subjects that appear multiple times in the Torah because the laws were not necessarily given all at the same time. Now we're told that all the laws were given at Sinai to Moshe, but certain laws were not relevant to the Jewish people until they entered the land of Israel. And therefore, as a result, Moshe didn't just inundate the nation with all the laws. He gave the laws that were relevant to them, And then later on, 40 years later, on the doorstep of Israel, he kind of finished the conveyance of Torah and gave them the laws that were more related to life in Israel. And that would answer why you find related mitzvos that some of them you get in the book of Exodus right after Sinai, and some of them you don't get to the book of, let's say, Numbers or or Deuteronomy, because at that juncture, Jewish nation is ready to enter the land. It's been 40 years. And now they have to know, okay, we're going to have a normal society and there's going to be more commerce and the like. And therefore, there are laws that are relevant to that society and that's when they get those laws then. Does that answer your question? The person who asked the question? Yeah, okay, it does. Uh, if you're borrowing something, the person uh, you are borrowing for dies. Yes, great question. <coughs> Someone is an owner of an item. If they die automatically that is transferred to the next of kin. So of course there are laws related to how, you know, the process of, of um, bequeathing uh, items happens, who does it go to and, and, and how, does, how exactly does it go, but it happens automatically. So if I own something and the person, or if, I, if someone gives me something and uh, it's mine to watch and that person dies, it doesn't become mine because it auto- instantly transfers ownership to their next of kin, to their heir, uh, even without anyone doing anything. Uh, depending on what was borrowed from me, I usually lend it with notification of its return and plan to obtain another. I like that. I say depending on the item because obviously borrowing a food processor is different from a plate. To buy another food processor is much more difficult if I had saved to acquire the first one um, yes, it is. Yeah, that, that, that's reasonable. Again, no one is obligated to give anyone anything. It's not an obligation. Uh, it's a nice thing to do. If someone wants to um, lend something, it's a mitzvah to, to, to be kind, to be generous. Um, you're not required to lend something and not expect to get it back. But if you do that, that is, um, listen, you did a mitzvah, you helped someone else, uh, you are not, uh, you're not required to do it. But if you want to do it, uh, it's okay. But again, there's nothing wrong with someone saying, hey, this is my item. I bought it. I paid for it. Please give it back to me. So, yeah. And and somehow with books, I think it's... I wonder why it's like that. Probably because 
people who borrow books want to read it. And people who own books that they want to read often don't get to that book. So they haven't, I want to read the book still and haven't gotten to it. That's probably the logic behind it. What do y'all say? I agree. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I put that in the same category as uh, socks that disappear in the washing machine. <laughs> the it's sock the, monster. The sock monster. It's just you you loan a book out. And, and this is the problem. <laughs> is there's probably so many books that I've loaned out. I don't even remember where they're at now. It's like, I once started making a list for yeah. books that I'm out. So a I checkout, can, I, uh, like a, a library checkout list. What I do do when I lend out a book, I make sure my names, my name and my phone number is, in the, is written down. So at least there may be a little twinge of guilt that if they happen to see the front page. <laughs> yes, I agree also. But it's also videos. When you loan out videos that are really good that you really want back. Yes. They don't come back either. But I just wanted to say, Stephanie, don't worry. I'll get you a book back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm now concerned of something I might have of Mary Lou's that I haven't returned. <laughs> I, I have a, I had a great story with this. Uh, my grandmother of blessed memory, she 